Okay, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tim Ricks. I am the former Chief Tom Officer of the U.S. Public Health Service. I'd like to welcome all of you to the third edition of our Healthy People 2030 Oral Health Promotion Series. The title of today's uh, presentation is Reducing Adults with Moderate or Severe Periodontal Disease. Um, I will introduce our speakers in a moment, but let me give you a few logistical things. This meeting, uh, this webinar is being recorded um, and the recording will be made available to everyone. Uh, if you have questions during the, the webinar, you can type them in the Q&A function by scrolling at the bottom of the screen and we'll, our speakers will try to answer those during the webinar if possible. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking uh, the American Academy of Periodontology for hosting the platform for this webinar and to our other um, partners in today's webinar, the American Institute of Dental Public Health and the Veterans Health Administration. None of the speakers today have any disclosures to report. And upon the completion of today's webinar, you should be able to define and describe Healthy People 2030 Oral Health Objective 0H-6. You should be able to list at least five associations between periodontal disease and systemic disease. And finally, you should be able to implement at least one strategy in your practice to improve early detection and treatment of patients with periodontal disease. Uh, our presentation will start today uh, with me. I'll give you an overview of Healthy People Objective 0H-6. I'll be followed by Dr. Brian Milley, who will talk about periodontal diseases and systemic health. He'll be followed by Dr. Annalise Cothran, who will talk about understanding veteran oral health in periodontal disease. We'll have a short Q&A um, session as time permits led by Dr. Patricia Arola. And then I'll provide a summary and announce the next uh, Healthy People 2030 webinar. So please let me introduce our distinguished panel today. Dr. Brian Milley is a clinical professor and former residency program director in the Department of Periodontics at the UT Health School of Dentistry in San Antonio, Texas. He previously served 21 years in the US Air Force where he was chair and residency program director in the Department of Periodontics at Wilfrid Hall Medical Center in San Antonio. Dr. Annalise Cothran is the co-founder and executive director of the American Institute of Dental Public Health, or AIDPH. Dr. Cothran is also an active member and leader within several national professional organizations and serves as a board member for Equality Texas, Texas Impact and the Texas Oral Health Coalition. In our present position at AIDPH, Dr. Cothran manages the programming, fund development, and overall organizational strategy to achieve AIDPH's mission of advancing the science and education of dental public health. Our last speaker will be Dr. Patricia Arola. She will actually moderate the Q&A. Dr. Arola has been the Assistant Undersecretary for Health in dentistry in the Department of Veteran Affairs since 2010. She is responsible for oversight of the VA's 233 dental clinics across the enterprise and leads the National Office of Dentistry team. Thank you to all of these presenters for taking time out of their schedules today. So let me start by giving you an overview of uh, Healthy People Objective 0H-6, and it reads as followed. By 2030, we would like to reduce the proportion of adults 45 years and older with moderate and severe periodontitis. Our baseline uh, that was established in 2020 is 44.5%, and we hope to decrease that to 39.3% of adults over 45, 45 and over. We are tying this into November because November is National Diabetes Month. The theme for National Diabetes Month this year is that today's diabetes hits different. Now I put a link there so you can read more about periodontal disease. We know periodontitis and diabetes are common 
uh, complex and chronic diseases with an established bidirectional relationship, which will be explored later in this webinar. Now, when we look at adults 30 years and over with periodontal disease using the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey data, what we see is some significant disparities with regard to race and ethnicity. As you can see in the green bar, 37.0% um, of non-Hispanic white Americans 30 years or older have periodontal disease or had it in that time period, compared to 56.6% of non-Hispanic black people, 59.7% of Mexican Americans, and 48.5% for other Hispanic uh, populations in the U.S. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I wanted to ensure that uh, the screen was shared in case you were pointing to specific data. Oh, my apologies. I, I was just going on and on. Thank you. It was wonderful and thrilling. I'm so glad you did. But I wanted to ensure if you meant to share your screen, you knew um, you knew to do to do so. Yes, thank you. Um, let me do that again, people. So again, this is the objective um, OH-6. Uh, and we're tying it to not National Diabetes Month. This is the um, URL if you want to learn more about National Diabetes Month. And here's the graph I just referenced. 37% of non-Hispanic whites have periodontal disease over the age of 30. And there's a significant disparity when you look at the proportion of non-Hispanic Blacks, um, Mexican-Americans, and other Hispanics with periodontal disease. You can see my screen now, correct? Yes, yeah, doctor. We, we can see it. Thank you. All right. So regarding National Diabetes Month, 37.3 million Americans, about one in 10 have diabetes. But more importantly, about one in five people with diabetes don't even know that they have it. More alarming, 96 million American adults, more than one out of every three Americans, have prediabetes and 80%, more than eight out of 10 with prediabetes, don't know that they have it. Uh, for people aged 10 to 19 years of age, new cases of type two diabetes increase for all racial and ethnic minority groups, especially black teens. And for adults with diagnosed diabetes, 69% had hypertension, 44% had high cholesterol, 39% had chronic kidney disease, and 12% reported having vision impairment or blindness. Diabetes was the highest among Black and Hispanic Latino adults in both men and women. Beyond knowing the associations between periodontitis and specific chronic diseases, which will be discussed in a few minutes, Periodontitis also increases the risk of many cardiovascular, cardiometabolic, autoimmune, and mental health conditions. And if you look at this um, graph here, you can see that the hazard ratio, adjusted hazard ratio um, for these different cardiovascular, cardiometabolic, autoimmune, mental health diseases are significantly higher with periodontal disease. Uh, anything over a one it, uh, puts people at more significant risk. So with that, I'm going to now transition over to our next speaker from the American Academy of Periodontology, Dr. Brian Milley. Dr. Milley. Thank, thank you, Dr. Ricks. I appreciate it. For the audience, uh, you'll hear me saying uh, next slide quite a bit because Dr. Ricks is going to be controlling the screen for us. So uh, for the next slide, Dr. Ricks. We're going, to, we're going to talk about periodontal diseases on systemic health for, for the next 20 minutes or so. And the, the basic questions here are, how is periodontal health or periodontal disease related to systemic health and to common diseases like diabetes, cardiovascular diseases? And we'll talk about some others too. And then secondly, what mechanisms may help explain that relationship? Next slide, please. So first of all, all, 
all of the dental people uh, on this webinar are used to thinking of periodontal diseases as inflammatory because they have all the signs of inflammation, redness, swelling. Uh, they bleed when we poke on them and, and they hurt when we poke on them. But we tend not to really appreciate how periodontal diseases are mucosal diseases. So, and they are, and it's that's a critical thing to understand in order to understand the relationships between periodontal disease and other systemic conditions. So the patient on our left who's a dentulist, has a mucosal niche very similar to other mucosal line surfaces in the body. Uh, it's the mucosa is colonized by bacteria, viruses, and fungi, microorganisms that are commensal. The, they're supposed to be there. The patient does just fine with them. But once we have the presence of teeth, that changes the environment dramatically. Now we have calcified objects protruding through the formerly intact mucosal surface. And that sets up a wound healing challenge uh, for the patient that's pretty significant. And that wound healing challenge turns out it's not only localized in the oral cavity, it has the potential to affect other organ systems. Next slide. So an example of this is if we get a, the, the largest uh, barrier in our body is our skin. So, but if we get a break in the skin, like a wound, uh, fortunately, you don't have a nail sticking through your finger. But if you did, uh, you would now have a, a break in the formerly intact skin barrier. So you're going to have microorganisms and their products will colonize that area. And then the patient will produce an immunoinflammatory response against those bacteria other microorganisms and their products. Similar thing happens is if you go into the hospital and have an IV line put in your arm or your hand, that has to be changed every 48 to 72 hours under medical standard of care because having now a piece of plastic sticking across what was formerly an intact dermal barrier, again, is the same kind of setup that we have on the next slide, if you will, uh, when we have 28 teeth sticking through the formerly uh, intact mucosal barrier. So again, this wound healing challenge, the bacteria and their products do not just remain on the teeth in the biofilm. They have the potential for systemic dissemination. And likewise, the inflammation in the oral cavity doesn't stay there either. It has the potential to affect inflammation in other organ systems. So in the next slide, we'll see what happens when we have a healthy periodontium. So this is a patient who has no redness, no bleeding, the bone levels are at a normal location in, in relationship to the CEJ, and the sulcus around the tooth is, is shallow. So in this case, it's about one and a half millimeters deep. If you look histologically on the right of this slide, the, the far right of that histologic section is the tooth and the left side is the gingiva. The yellow arrows are pointing to the thin sulcular epithelial barrier down in the sulcus that separates the biofilm that's on the tooth from the systemic vasculature that's inside the gingiva. So in health, that's not such a big deal because the biofilm is relatively, the bacteria are not particularly pathogenic and, uh, and that uh, sulcular epithelial barrier is intact. But on the next slide, we see the difference between health and, and uh, disease. So now we have a biofilm that has lots of pathogenic bacteria in it, producing a number of noxious uh, products that stimulate a massive immunoinflammatory response, which ends up in the oral cavity, resulting in bone loss around the teeth, gingival swelling, et cetera. But now where those yellow arrows are pointing, that sulcus is deeper. That sulcular epithelium is longer, it's thinner, and eventually it becomes ulcerated, meaning now there is no barrier between the biofilm contents and the systemic circulation that's in the gingiva. Next slide, please. So we're, uh, when we go from health to disease in the oral cavity, it's not only about the biofilm, the bacteria and other microorganisms and their products in the biofilm, it's about this immunoinflammatory response that we have. And the more teeth that are affected by periodontal diseases, the more intense that inflammatory response is, and the more likely it is to have the potential to disseminate through the bloodstream to other organ systems. Next slide. So we're going to kind of talk initially about, Dr. Rick's already covered how highly prevalent the periodontitis is in the United States and the risk groups. And now we're going to talk about some of those conditions that periodontitis may be associated with.
So next slide, we're gonna start with diabetes. This is National uh, Diabetes Month. These are two patients, different patients. The clinical photo is different than the, the patient on the bottom, but these are both two patients with undiagnosed diabetes. As Dr. Ricks mentioned, a large number of patients with type two diabetes are walking around for years with type two and they don't even know they have it. The good news is most of our patients who walk into our dental offices with diabetes don't look like this. But if we see a patient like this with all this tissue kind of growing up out of the, out of the sulcus, the patient on the bottom, those x-rays are each taken four years apart. This was a patient that was coming into the office every six months, just like we asked him to do and had good oral hygiene. And yet the bone is melting off the teeth for some reason. Well, it turns out that reason is the patient has undiagnosed diabetes. So on the next slide, uh, we've got over 60 years of data that look at this question. Does diabetes increase the risk of gingivitis and or periodontitis? And what those data tell us is that poorly controlled diabetes is associated with an increased risk in gingivitis, gingival inflammation, in the severity of inflammation, and in the extent of inflammation. Likewise, uh, poorly controlled diabetes is, is associated with an increase in the risk of periodontitis by about threefold or 300%. So clearly poorly controlled diabetes affects the risk of periodontitis. And over time in a patient that has periodontitis, the risk of them losing more and more bone around the teeth when they have periodontitis and poorly controlled diabetes is much greater than if they have periodontitis without diabetes. So the bottom line here is that poorly controlled diabetes is a risk factor for periodontal diseases. Interestingly, the, the data suggests that well-controlled diabetes is not a significant increase for the risk of gingival, uh, gingivitis and periodontitis. So the key for our patients with diabetes is glycemic control. And if a patient doesn't know she has diabetes, her glycemic control is gonna be poor because she's not doing anything to manage it. Next slide, please. So what about the other side of this coin? If diabetes has the potential to impact periodontal health, what impact might periodontal diseases have on the metabolic control of diabetes in patients who have diabetes? And then does the treatment of inflammatory periodontal disease have any measurable impact on the metabolic control of diabetes? Next slide. So, <clears throat> Uh, we don't obviously have time to go into this in detail, but this was a very nicely done study where they took two groups of well-controlled diabetic patients. One group also had periodontitis and the other group did not have periodontitis. And they followed these folks over time asking this question, does the presence of periodontitis have any impact on the risk of worsening blood sugar control over time. This was a two-year longitudinal study. So what they found was, is the diabetic patients who did not have periodontitis, about 11% of them had a worsening of their blood sugar control over this two-year period. Conversely, 37% of the diabetic patients with periodontitis had a worsening of their blood sugar control over time. So the presence of this oral infection, periodontitis, had an impact on the risk of poor metabolic control of diabetes. Importantly here, notice that in the bar on your right, 63% of the diabetic patients with periodontitis did not have a worsening of their blood sugar control. So yes, periodontitis increased the risk of worsening blood sugar control in people with diabetes. This is type two diabetes, but it doesn't mean just because the patient has periodontitis, their diabetes control is gonna somehow go out of whack. Next slide, please. So, so how is it possible that periodontal diseases could affect glycemic control? We think what's going on here is, uh, is the relationship between inflammation and insulin resistance. So type two diabetes is a disease of insulin resistance. So the patient's still making insulin. It's just not as functional as it needs to be at the target organs. So what we know from a lot of good medical research is that inflammatory conditions, whether they're acute, like having an acute respiratory infection, et cetera, or whether they're chronic inflammatory conditions, that elevated level of inflammatory mediators in the bloodstream increases insulin resistance and makes glycemic control more difficult in patients with diabetes. So the question then is, is what about periodontitis? 
This is an oral chronic inflammatory disease that quite frankly isn't different than other chronic inflammatory diseases in the way it impacts systemic inflammation. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> what we, if we took 500 patients with periodontitis and 500 patients without periodontitis and drew blood and look at the serum levels of a number of mediators of inflammation and markers of inflammation, this is what we would find. On average, the patients with periodontitis have higher levels of pro-inflammatory mediators and markers of inflammation than the non-periodontitis patients do. If we then treat the 500 patients with periodontitis through periodontal therapy, on average, we see a significant reduction in the level of those pro-inflammatory mediators and markers of inflammation. So that's the case whether the patient has diabetes or not. Here's the problem with diabetes. In the patient who has elevated levels of systemic inflammation, we know that that is related to an increase in insulin resistance. So again, in the diabetic patient with periodontitis, they have a lot more inflammation in the oral cavity, but it doesn't just stay in the oral cavity. We have an elevated inflammation in the bloodstream, meaning it's going all throughout all the organs in the body. And then if, that di if the diabetic patient with periodontitis gets treated, that level of insulin resistance decreases. And there's quite a bit of research that shows that in diabetic patients who have their periodontitis treated, they often have an improvement in glycemic control. Next slide, please. So, so let's, with some of that as a background for some of these other conditions, let's talk about cardiovascular diseases and periodontal disease. What is the relationship there? Next slide, please. So there's, uh, there's a lot of data looking at this question. Is periodontitis an independent risk factor for certain cardiova cardiovascular disease-related outcomes? CHD in this slide stands for coronary heart disease. So is periodontitis an independent risk factor for coronary heart disease-related events, such as a sudden a myocardial infarction or a sudden onset of angina? This is an older study, but I like it because they grouped, this is a systematic review, a very high level of evidence, and they grouped the studies that they examined by their level of evidence. So cross-sectional studies are a lower level of evidence than case control studies, which are a lower level of evidence than prospective cohort, st cohort studies, which are the high level of evidence. And what they found in this systematic review is, is no matter what the type of evident level of evidence was, periodontitis was a significant independent risk factor of coronary heart disease related events. What do I mean by independent? That means independent of the other known risk factors for coronary heart disease related events, such as hypertension, uh, diabetes, smoking, et cetera. Next slide, please. So more recent systematic reviews have found a similar, a similar thing when they examine individual studies looking at this relationship. This is a very nicely done systematic review. And this is the conclusion from the, from the review. And that is that current evidence supports the idea that the risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular diseases, for cerebrovascular disease, including stroke, and for peripheral arterial disease is higher in people with periodontitis compared to those without periodontitis, independent of other known cardiovascular disease risk factors. In many of these individual 12 studies, that relationship between periodontitis and coronary heart disease was stronger in the younger people than it was in the older people. Next slide, please. So what are the mechanisms that may explain this relationship? From what I've talked about so far, one of the things I'm trying to drive home is that what happens in the mouth, what happens in Vegas doesn't stay in Vegas. What happens in the oral, the oral cavity is not a sequestered body part. It's connected to the rest of the body through the systemic vasculature. So what's going in the, on in the oral cavity can easily affect other organ systems. In the relationship with coronary vascular diseases, there's a couple of mechanisms that are probably operant here. One of those has to deal with atherosclerosis. So bacteria and their products are commonly found in uh, uh, atheromas in patients with periodontitis. And these are oral bacteria that I'm speaking of. So you have a, a distant blood vessel like your external carotid or your the epicardial arteries around your heart. And the atheromas within those distant blood vessels contain bacteria and their products that actually came from the oral cavity. This has been shown at least 20 times. And it's actually quite common 
40 to 50 percent of these atheromas outside the oral cavity can end up with bacterial and their products in, in these distant uh, from the oral uh, from periodontitis uh, into the distant uh, vessel. So another uh, another thing that we find is is that when those bacteria are present within the atheroma, they strongly affect, or even just on the surface of the endothelial lining of the blood vessel, they adversely affect the function of vascular endothelium. And altered vascular endothelial function is a very known, a well-known risk factor for acute thromboembolic events, such as a stroke, myocardial infarction, et cetera. And even normal daily activity like chewing or flossing, et cetera. When you look at patients with periodontitis or even gingivitis, a lot of gingival inflammation, those folks are more at risk of inducing a bacteremia, bacterial spread through the bloodstream, just during normal daily activities. Next slide, please. So another potential mechanism, and I think this is probably one of the strongest mechanisms relating uh, periodontal health to cardiovascular disease risk, is this. We already mentioned that when you have periodontitis, particularly when it's extensive, affects a lot of teeth, and it's severe. So you have a lot of bone loss, a lot of deep pocketing, et cetera, a lot of inflammation. We have an elevation in the level of systemic inflammation in those patients with periodontitis. While many of those inflammatory mediators that become elevated in the bloodstream in patients with periodontitis are actually well-known cardiovascular risk factors for having things like myocardial infarction and stroke. There's a few of them listed on this screen, fibrinogen, C-reactive protein, interleukin-6. All of those mediators and markers of inflammation are elevated in the bloodstream of patients with periodontitis. And they're all well-recognized risk factors for, uh, for acute myocardial infarction or stroke. Next slide, please. So uh, let's move on now to talk about uh, brain conditions, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, et cetera, and their relationship with periodontal diseases. There's a number of schools of thought of, as to how Alzheimer's disease is initiated and progresses, and they're on the screen. The reality is probably a combination of, of these three hypotheses, but notice that one of them is microbiome infection hypothesis, and the uh, another one is inflammation host response hypothesis. So bacteria can enter the brain and, and elevate uh, inflammation within the brain. Likewise, elevated inflammatory mediators in the serum are going to pass through the brain. Next slide, please. So uh, what does this have to do with periodontal disease? So there are a number of different types of studies that have shown that patients with periodontitis and even gingivitis have a higher risk of cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease. Now, not all studies agree with that conclusion, but the majority of them do. So there, there appears to at least be a foundation for a relationship between Alzheimer's and uh, periodontal health. Next slide, please. So what, are, what could the mechanisms be if there really is a relationship? One of those is, is that, again, the elevated serum levels of inflammatory mediators that are associated with the oral infection end up in the brain as well as other organ systems, like I've already mentioned. And secondly, some of the pathogens that are really strongly associated with periodontitis actually play a role in Alzheimer's disease. And these organisms can disseminate through the bloodstream or their products can disseminate through the bloodstream to the brain. So uh, on the next slide, you'll see that there's uh, one of the examples of, a, of an organism like this is Porphyromonas gingivalis. So this is an organism very closely linked uh, to periodontitis. And this particular genus of bacteria, Porphyromonas, produces a group of enzymes that are called gingipanes that break down proteins. That's the purpose of these enzymes. What has been found, if you look at the brains of patients with Alzheimer's disease and compare those to the, these are, this is obviously post-mortem, uh, compare those to the brains of patients with Alzheimer, without Alzheimer's disease, what you find is, is that the Alzheimer brains have very high levels of this group of protease enzymes called gingipanes. And gingipanes are only produced by this genus of bacteria. So 
why would they be a problem? Because in the brain, they break down proteins such as amyloid. So you end up with in, an increase in amyloid beta protein fragments in the brain and an increase in tau neurofibrillary tangles, which are two classic features of Alzheimer's disease. So in animal models, if you inoculate animal models with either this organism or directly with the gingipane enzymes, you, what you find after the animals have been inoculated is, is in the brain, they end up with the classic brain changes associated with Alzheimer's disease. Again, increased amyloid beta fragments and these tau neurofibrillary tangles. Next slide, please. So, <clears throat> so again, there, there are mechanisms that could explain a relationship between periodontal disease and dementia, Alzheimer's, et cetera. Now we'll move to uh, respiratory diseases. So <clears throat> some, some large epidemiologic databases that have been gathered over years and decades actually, suggest that when you look at patients without periodontitis and then you compare them to patients with periodontitis, the risk of uh, obstructive, obstructive airway disease is higher in the patients with periodontitis than in those without periodontitis. And it's a little bit higher in those with severe periodontitis compared to moderate levels of periodontitis. But in these studies, the relationship is often confounded by smoking because smoking is a huge risk factor for respiratory diseases. And it's also a big risk factor for periodontal diseases. So sometimes in these studies, they'll find this relationship between periodontal disease and obstructive airway disease only in the smokers, but not in the non-smokers. So that's just a problem of, of confounding of risk factors. Next slide, please. So what about asthma? So uh, again, recently there have been a, a couple of very nice either studies or systematic reviews of multiple studies that have shown that, the, uh, for example, if you look at patients with uh, uh, high gingival inflammation, lots of gingival bleeding, that in, in patients with asthma, you see that more commonly than you do in age-matched patients without asthma. So gingival inflammation seems to have a relationship anyway with the risk of, of uh, asthma. And other studies have found a similar thing in patients with periodontitis, not just gingivitis, where asthma is strongly associated with periodontitis. And in some of these studies, that's even after adjusting for whether or not the patients smoke in the study. Next slide, please. So uh, another important uh, respiratory condition is nosocomial pneumonia. So this is hospital acquired pneumonia. And this has been studied actually quite a lot. And what they found is that patients with poorer health who go into the hospital are at a great poorer periodontal health go into the hospital, they're at a greater risk for hospital acquired pneumonia than patients with good periodontal health. And this is especially true if they're on a ventilator. So a patient who's gonna be on a ventilator who has poor oral hygiene, which most do because they're not having adequate oral care while they're on a ventilator, that increases the risk of hospital acquired pneumonia, which frankly in ventilator uh, patients can cause death. There have been a number of intervention studies sh that show that in hospital, if oral hygiene procedures are, are implemented in patients at risk for nosocomial pneumonia, that the rate of nosocomial pneumonia actually goes down. So oral hygiene appears to be important in these patients as well. Next slide, please. And then finally, uh, I really only have this one slide for cancer. We could talk for a long time about this, but there is emerging evidence, some of which is quite strong and some of which is not, is not at least at this stage. And there are association studies that have found significant relationships between, again, periodontal diseases and the risk of a number of types of cancer. And they're kind of listed on the screen. Some of these have pretty strong evidence and others, again, they haven't been studies as much. Uh, but the odds of having a lot, a lot of these cancers are significant, significantly higher in patients with periodontitis, but the, the magnitude of effect is, is relatively low. In other words, it's not a tenfold increase in the risk of pancreatic cancer in patients who have periodontitis. It's a significant risk, but it's lower than that. And again, association studies do not prove causation. In other words, none of these studies show that periodontal disease actually causes these cancers. The probable mechanism that's being looked at 
is again inflammation because inflammation is a huge risk factor for a lot of these cancers and a risk factor in the progression of the cancer state. So again, in patients who have elevated serum levels of inflammatory mediators, no matter what the source, that can increase the risk of these cancers and progression of these cancers with periodontal diseases being one of those potential sources. Uh, next slide. So uh, that's it for me. Uh, I'm just now gonna introduce Dr. Annalise Cothran and let her take over from here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mealy. And I really appreciate you setting me up for success here. Um, as we talk about what periodontal, periodontal disease looks like in veterans. And the intention really of my presentation was to apply these clinical insights that Dr. Mealy has shared and contextualize some of that as it relates to veterans and their oral health and kind of drill down into the specific subgroup from a population health perspective um, as we're considering this uh, 2030 goal. Next slide, please. Um, to share a bit of background about you know, why and how we began focusing on veteran oral health, I wanted to sort of take a few steps back and share um, kind of our, our backstory here. So at the beginning of 2021, AIDPH partnered with CareQuest Institute for Oral Health to really understand the current landscape of veteran oral health. And we quickly realized, which I'll share in a moment, that very little data existed. And so we kind of took it upon ourselves at that point to then engage in research, which is kind of this first bucket um, of content and activation to explore opportunities to then improve access and inform advocacy efforts. Next slide, please. And this is really just a brief overview of sort of how we got to today um, and what we've been doing in order to inform our work around veteran oral health. And this is, you know, almost two years now worth of work um, diving into understanding the current landscape for veterans and their oral health and well-being. So as I mentioned earlier, we started at the very beginning of 2021 investigating where available data uh, existed you know, just any available data around veteran oral health. And we realized that it was pretty limited. Um, we explored Burfitt's data and NHANES data. Um, but aside from that, there just there wasn't a lot for us to go on in terms of uh, informing our strategy and, and really understanding the path forward and to improve access to care for veterans and, and improve oral health outcomes too. And so seeing limited available data, we launched a survey in July of 2021 that ultimately garnered over 2,000 veteran respondents about accessing uh, dental care and really understanding both self-reported self physical and oral health outcomes. And so beginning in December of last year, we've released three publications with a fourth coming out at the end of November focused on access to oral health care, um, economic implications of veteran oral health care, and then two papers. Uh, one will be released at the end of this month focused on rural veterans. We also have created a dashboard on veteran oral health and an effort to democratize our data. And I just want to be really transparent in that I hope to hear from all of you, too, as you look through this and consider the context in which Dr. Mealy has really uh, set us up to consider veteran oral health. We are always looking for more partners. We are always looking for um, for community members to help us understand where the gaps are and what we could do to expedite this initiative. Next slide, please. And so we, um, I, I mentioned last year that we um, we disseminated a survey. We've done so again this year too, using our community engaged research model, which means that we partner with veterans, uh, veteran service organizations specifically like the BFW, Minority Veterans of America, um, disabled American veterans who help us really shape our data collection approach 
they inform the tactics that we use, um, what we examine, how we explore this model. And then um, we have shared data. Um, they access have copies of all of the data. And then we ensure that the outcomes of this data are directly applied in the veteran community. So I just wanted to to sort of one, thank our veteran partners for helping us uh, with this approach. And then two, recognize that um, our data are ultimately used um, and applied in veterans and in, the, in their communities. Next slide, please. So uh, through this data gathering process, I wanted to first ground us in um, and what the current landscape of veteran oral health looks like as it relates to access to care. And so some of this is just basic data that we've pulled um, you know, from, from the VA and federal statistics. And some of this was from that 2021 survey that we released last year. But the statistic that I hope folks remember is that about 85% of veterans don't have access to dental care through the VA. And that's because of very strict eligibility criteria that is set by Congress and written into the federal code. Um, and so of that 85% um, who, who don't have dental care, of the 15% that, that are eligible for dental care through the VA, about a third utilize that benefit. Um, and whenever we surveyed veterans last year and sort of asked them, you know, do you know if you have access to dental care through the VA? Where are you accessing your care? How much do you pay for it? Um, of those 2,000 plus respondents, about 42% of them indicated that they actually didn't understand if they had access to dental care through the VA and what those benefits may look like. And so some of that utilization rate could be linked to not understanding the care available to them. Um, but despite that, about 44% of respondents indicated that they needed to see a dentist in the past year. Um, so some of, you know, a, a large majority, you know, about 60% almost, um, was able to see a dentist in the past year. Um, and of those who couldn't see a dentist and needed to, it was because of cost. Next slide, please. And so I'm reinforcing here what Dr. Amelia has already presented, which is the oral systemic connection and all of the different um, chronic disease conditions that impact ultimately uh, how we are able to maintain good oral health. And of course, this is what I'm focusing on in our veteran population. This has actually been kind of a, a hallmark or a core approach to the work that we've done here at AIDPH, which is not to just focus on oral health outcomes, but also understanding the connections um, in whole person health and specifically in veterans. Next slide, please. So I'd like to just run through some data points over this slide and the next few, talking about um, all of those different chronic disease conditions that we just learned about, how they're all connected, and, and focus on how that's important and how that's represented um, among a population of veterans. And so some of this is actually pulled from BRFIS. So what you're seeing right here is from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. And I'll try to clarify where our data come from and uh, what sources as we move through this data, the sources of the data. Um, but again, looking through this integrated approach to veteran oral health care, 13% of veterans reported having poor physical health compared to 10% of non-veterans. Veterans also have higher prevalence of chronic disease conditions um, as it relates to heart disease, almost three times the amount of, of chronic of heart disease compared to non-veterans. And so these have really significant implications on veterans and their oral health. And when you compare that to challenges with utilization, knowing that there are high chronic disease conditions, poor oral health outcomes, and potentially poor access to care in some veteran populations, it really does um, bring a lot of concern into how we are, um, how veterans are experiencing their oral health. Next slide, please. So again, this is um, from the Burfus analysis that we released earlier this year. And what we actually looked at um, was veterans versus non-veterans. We also looked at subcategories within veterans um, to include income, rurality, um, 
chronic disease condition prevalence, et cetera. And so this slide in particular is looking at veterans and non-veterans, and then also veterans with diabetes and veterans with heart disease compared to non-veterans with diabetes and non-veterans with heart disease. And what we see is that veterans have, again, as I just presented, a higher prevalence of both diabetes and heart disease. Interestingly, veterans uh, in this BRFIS data set had higher reported um, uh, dental visits in the last year compared to non-veterans. But when we look at an outcome like edentalism or losing all your permanent teeth, we actually see that veterans with diabetes and heart disease have worse oral health outcomes, even though they're reporting seeing um, a dentist within the past year. Next slide, please. And even after controlling for factors like income, education, and rurality, veterans with diabetes were 40% more likely to be indentulous than veterans without diabetes. And so we are seeing, um, again, all of those inflammatory processes, all of those oral systemic connections are really validated in the outcomes that we look at within a veteran population. Next slide. Uh, this statistic and, and this chart is from our veteran oral health survey that we released in 2021. And so we asked veterans if they had experienced any of these conditions in the past 12 months. And as you can see, there are several indicators that um, that show that that veterans, you know, within the sample of, again, more than 2000, um, there are several indicators that periodontal disease was something that veterans were struggling with. Um, and when that's paired with, again, lack of access to care, other chronic disease conditions, we realized that this broader picture around veterans and their oral health is complicated, and that does make um, solutions and you know, potential ways to improve oral health and, and their outcomes um, more complicated. Next slide, please. And so how this relates to periodontal care from um, a prevention perspective, we wound up analyzing these data earlier this year at the beginning of 2021, and this report was released in April. Um, so it was, it was based on a BRFIS analysis, it was based on survey data responses, and it was also based on um, actuarial models of how we could actually save money by you know, giving access to care for veterans who have, in particular, diabetes and heart disease, um, giving them access to routine uh, dental care and periodontal care. Not only does that improve their total health outcomes, um, next slide, um, but it also results in a pretty significant cost savings. And so we calculated these uh, utilization rates and cost savings estimates based on Cigna Healthcare um, estimations. And, you know, at a 25% utilization rate, 50% and 75% utilization rate, just even if we had a 50% utilization rate by expanding access to care for veterans, we know that we're saving billions for both um, diabetes and heart disease. Um, it looks like for um, diabetes, we can save, you know, almost, we can save just over $2 billion at a 50% utilization rate. Um, I'm sorry, that was heart disease. And then for diabetes, about $3.5 billion. In our report, we actually coupled this with cost savings from also avoiding emergency department use, um, which veterans have. Um, in, in some estimates that we found, it's almost double emergency department use compared to non-veterans for um, for non-traumatic dental conditions. And so really the, the compounding effect and cost of not being able to access periodontal care effectively can really be significant. Next slide. So I wanted to leave everybody with a quote here today, because while I presented a lot of statistics and a lot of facts and figures, I really want to reinforce that um, behind each one of those numbers is an actual person. And I'm providing a quote here from a veteran that I actually worked with personally over a series of months trying to 
um, funnel him into care in one way or another. He expressed multiple times how he was embarrassed at the state of his mouth and teeth, that he felt like he couldn't effectively seek employment, that he was struggling with interactions with his family. He, you know, he said, I just, my breath is really bad. And um, no matter what I do, I, I can't seem to find dental care. Even when he did get some form of coverage for dental care, um, at that point, his, the state of his mouth and teeth had, um, had really um, progressed to a state where he was going to have to pay a lot of money out of pocket and still couldn't afford it. And so I just wanted to remind people that behind each one of these numbers is a real person who really is struggling. And um, I think it's important for us um, to, re to remember that veterans, um, at least in my opinion, truly do deserve better. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Arola as our session moderator for a question and answer session. Thank you so much, Dr. Cawthron. The first question goes to Dr. Mealy. What should the dentist in private practice do to decrease the incidence of periodontal disease? So in the, in the private practice, well, I think probably the first, the first thing would be uh, basically any patient that's got teeth uh, should, should have the periodontium looked at, you know, rather than just, just the teeth. Obviously we're talking about adults today. So if you think about, I'm not talking about doing a comprehensive periodontal exam on every single patient that walks in the door, but I do think that screening for periodontal diseases is important for everybody, uh, not, not even just adults. I mean, you look at uh, some of the worst forms of periodontal diseases, most severe anyway, can occur in, in teenagers. So, um, once, a, once the, the teeth are in, we should at least be probing the sulcus and looking for bleeding or increased probing depth, et cetera. Uh, I would say that the dental office is a little bit like, uh, you know, think about patients with hypertension or like type 2 diabetes, as we talked about today. Those are both kind of occult diseases. You know, the patient most of the time doesn't even know they're there. So is periodontitis. Uh, patients very rarely know that periodontitis is present until a dentist tells them that. So just like I would expect my physician to check my blood, or I'm sorry, to check my blood pressure when I go in for an exam, or certainly if I had, was in a risk category, uh, to check my blood sugar when I go into for an exam through, through laboratory work, I think I would, as a dental patient, I would expect my dentist and dental hygienist, frankly, to uh, do a periodontal screening exam. <clears throat> And, the, and then if, you, if we find periodontitis, then determine how it needs to be treated, whether it's going to be in the initial dental uh, office or if that dentist wants to refer it to, to, to a specialist, for example. Thank you. And then a follow-on question for you. What is the role of the rest of the dental team in controlling periodontal disease? Yeah, so uh, the dental hygienist... Um, in my opinion, plays the biggest role in the in the dental office for this because the dental hygienist usually spends more time with patients than does the dentist herself or, or himself. Um, so I think that dental hygienist is a really key part of the team. But even beyond that, I just think about the front desk, uh, the, the dental assistant. Patients talk to dental assistants all the time. So that's an opportunity to, to talk to the patient about risk factors for periodontal disease, some of the signs and symptoms, and kind of prepare them for that uh, exam and to emphasize how important that is for prevention. E even the hospital, or I'm sorry, even the dental office environment can, can be a player in this. You know, a lot of dental offices have a, a TV that may be playing some type of a, uh, a dental uh, videos, et cetera. And there's a lot of those available that look at prevention of, of periodontal diseases. So, I mean, heck, they talk about it at church and at the grocery store. Uh, if they really want to want to go out and spread the word, that, that'd be great. <laughs> Thanks so much, Dr. Mealy. Next, a question for Dr. Cothran. Are there specific concerns unique to veterans that make them more susceptible to periodontal disease? Yeah, thank you for that question, Dr. Arola. Um, I'll, I'll first start by saying there are places where it's certainly not unique to veterans. I mean, you know, we understand that just in general, people who have diabetes, chronic heart disease, et cetera, um, that they experience poor oral health outcomes or have the potential to have, a, have the risk to. 
I will also say that veterans, like many Americans, are also experiencing, you know, siloed and fragmented healthcare systems where it can be really challenging to access um, consistent and affordable dental care. So I, I would say in those places, um, veterans certainly aren't unique. But what our data do reinforce is that veterans are uniquely experiencing higher chronic disease conditions, um, a higher burden of disease and disability as it relates to their military service. Service. Um, we also know that that effect is compounded based on factors like rurality and income and education. And so it really does paint this sort of complex picture of needing to approach veteran dental care um, with all of those uh, conditions in mind. And I would also say that it really points to an integrated health system as being the most effective support for veterans and really addressing these complex care needs, um, knowing that veterans are struggling to access care and they have higher chronic disease conditions, a whole person and whole body approach would really be the best way to meet and address those needs. Thanks so much. So that's all the time we have for questions. I'd like to thank those who sent in questions ahead of time, those who placed them in the Q&A box uh, here during the presentation. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Ricks. Thank you, Dr. Rolla. And everyone that did type questions, we will be saving those questions and um, we'll try to get our experts to answer those. Uh, let me go back and share my screen as we close this out. So again, thank you to our presenters. Let me just reiterate that Oral Health Objective 0806 is reduce the proportion of adults 45 years and older with moderate and severe periodontitis. The Federal Oral Health Work Group for Healthy People came up with some strategies that we think will help everyone whether you're in an FQHC, uh, in private practice, or in some other public health environment. And they are as follows. Um, and this first one pretty much ap uh, applies to all healthy people objectives. Improve access to care, uh, especially to minority populations, veterans, and those in rural America using an integrated model approach. In other words, um, using every available workforce member you can, uh, including our medical providers and, and others. Number two, screen all patients with a permanent dentition for periodontal disease, as Dr. Milley uh, just mentioned. And given the alarming um, rate of diabetes in teens, this is even more uh, important. Number three, educate patients, including teens, about periodontal disease prevention and the relationships between periodontitis and chronic diseases, which were discussed in detail today. And finally, for patients with gingivitis and mild periodontitis, don't delay in treating or appropriately referring those patients and providing evidence-based oral hygiene instructions and aids to them. So our uh, next webinar, our fourth in the series of Healthy People 2030 uh, objectives will be December the 7th. Now you may have seen some postings that had December the 6th, but the correct date is December 7th uh, at 12 o'clock Central Standard Time, uh, where we will talk about reducing untreated decay in children and adolescents our partners for that webinar are the Alliance for a Cavity-Free Future, the North American chapter, uh, American Association of Dental Boards, and the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA. Um, I would like to once again thank our uh, three um, partners today, which are the American Academy of Periodontology, the American Institute of Dental Public Health, and the Veterans Health Administration VA Dentistry. As far as continuing education, for those that registered, you will receive one CE credit for this live webinar and your CE certificates will be issued via the email you use for registration within five to seven days. Immediately after the end of this webinar, uh, you will have a um, pop-up that uh, takes you to a survey 
And we ask that you complete that survey immediately as soon as the webinar ends. And finally, I'd like to direct you to other resources. You can go to healthypeople.gov to learn more about the uh, 11 oral health objectives in Healthy People 2030. You can browse by condition. You can look at other uh, conditions as well because there are several hundred uh, Healthy People objectives. There are also um, oral health access is one of the leading health indicators, which shows the importance of oral health access um, in overall health. And then there are actually toolkits on how you can actually apply uh, these healthy people objectives to your everyday practice, whether it's public health or private practice. So with that, we will end today's webinar. Thank you again to our distinguished panelists, Dr. Brian Milley from the American Academy uh, periodontology, Dr. Annalise Cothran from the American Institute of Dental Public Health, and our moderator for questions, Dr. Patricia Arola from the VA uh, Dentistry Program. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Rex.